Hello and welcome to Tarim Talks. I'm here with Subi Bora, creative team director of Zalij, who was also the co-creator of the Atlas project. How are you today, Subi? I'm good. I'm excited to be here. So I just want to dive right into this. Um, what is keeping you busy right now? What's keeping me busy right now is I'm actually planning to go overseas in the next week. So I'm just um, preparing for that. And where are you planning on going? I'm going to Uzbekistan and Istanbul. That's very cool. Those are um, places where a lot of wheel wars are residing right now. Uh, so how long are you planning to be gone and what are you planning to do while you're there? Um, so I'm planning to be there for all up four weeks. Um, Uzbekistan is a bit of a side project, um, just hoping to film some content and things like that and reconnect with my Uzbek sort of heritage. Um, and in Istanbul, I'll just be there for Ramadan, inshallah. So when you say that you're uh, creating content, what exactly are you creating content for? Um, well, I'm creating content with a friend who actually runs a YouTube channel, um, and he's always wanted to go to Uzbekistan. So uh, when we met, we were like, yeah, we should like totally like do a project together there one day. Um, and the, the idea is that, um, well, actually we filmed the first half of this content, uh, when he visited Sydney, Australia. So we kind of filmed like the family home, um, like making Uyghur food at home and things like that. Like speaking about things like what it means to be Uyghur, um, in Australia and exploring things around like that third culture kid sort of experience. Um, and we wanted to film the second, second half of that in Uzbekistan. And um, so that's kind of like the, the reason that's taking us there. And we also want to spend a bit of time exploring um, the tradition of textiles in, in the area as well and connecting with like different NGOs and, and people on the creative scene. That's our goal. It's very cool, um, especially the idea of, mixing together or learning more about the culture in Uzbekistan and also the third culture as you described it. Yeah. So you had mentioned earlier that you were born in Adelaide. Yeah. What do you think of that situation that I'm sure a lot of Uyghurs today are kind of in the third culture situation, born in a different country and feeling these this push and pull uh, between two cultures? How do you reconcile that? Um, I think for me, I spent a lot of my childhood, mainly when I was in Adelaide, um, sort of immersed in the Uyghur community in a way, just like in a really like natural way, because like all my cousins and, and things like that are there. And so it, it always had like a really nice community feel. And I always um, knew I had that connection like to the culture. Um, but then you always know that like it's something a bit different that like your friends at school might not share, <laughs> for example. Um, but to be honest, I think my parents did a really good job of just allowing us to also have a very Australian experience, if that makes sense. Like, um, going down to the beach and, you know, things like that, which is very much like a part of Australian culture <laughs> and like having barbecues and going fishing and stuff. So I feel like while I knew that I was strongly Uyghur in a way, you know, I still had an, an Australian experience, but that led to some interesting, I guess, um, points of what's the word dissonance where you're trying to figure out, you know, like how Australian am I and like, why do I look different? And you're not seeing yourself represented, you know, around you and like the, the TV shows that you watch and, and kind of like struggling <laughs> to like say your own name as well, like pronouncing it in the correct way. You come across like these little points of like friction, I think, um, along the journey. And I guess like for me, um, as I got older, so that was very much when I was in my early childhood sort of years. And, and as I got older, like as a teenager or young adult, I guess, um, you become more, well, I became more aware of um, the stories of our people um, in the back in East Turkestan, in Hulja specifically, for my side of the family. And it never sort of sounded real, if that makes sense. It, it was always kind of like, how could this be happening? And like, like, you know, like, where's the validation for it? <laughs> Coming from like a very Western sort of mind frame, I guess it's like, you need the evidence and like, all that kind of stuff. But having said that, like, I would you know, always accompany my parents or like my dad to, you know, protests and things like that. And just like, having that awareness in the home was always there. But I think like, like having that awareness also it made me care about it, but it also made me feel a bit like 
I don't want to be involved in politics, for example, right? Like I just, I just wanted to also be able to forge a bit of my own sort of space of, of like what I'm, what my skills are and what I'm good at and how, how that can sort of do what it can to help support the cause in a way that's not necessarily so advocacy based, if that makes sense. So it's an interesting mix, like growing up, not quite sure of like the limits, I guess, of your, no limits, as in like where your identity starts and stops and how they comfortably sit next to each other or um, within one another. And then as I got older, I was like, like the issues that are faced by the Uyghur people are very serious and it's almost irresponsible if I didn't use like my years of experience and knowledge in, in the areas that I have Hamzala, the opportunity to develop if I didn't use that in some way for for advocacy but in a way that makes sense for what I can contribute realistically. That's very well said and I think that a lot of people can relate to that feeling, the the feeling to do something more for the people uh, using the skills that they have. And I think this is exactly what you did when you uh, worked to launch the Uyghur Atlas project. Now, could you tell me a little bit more about where this idea to launch this project came from? Sure. So the project actually came from my friend, um, Intazar, Intazar Elham. Um, so she currently lives in Adelaide as well, actually. So we've been good friends for a while. Um, and her background, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me sharing. She's actually a chiropractor. But she started an Instagram page called Touch of Turkestan, which you guys should totally check out on Instagram. And um, through that, her and another friend of ours, um, another mutual friend, um, they connected and, and they had an idea to make shirts to raise awareness and also raise money um, for the Uhur cause. So my two friends actually came up with the initial idea and then um, they shared it with me. And I was like, hey, like, this is cool, but you guys don't have any um, anyone really that can help push the the graphic sort of elements forward and like the creative sort of, you know, visual side, side of things forward. So I joined the team and the three of us really worked on, on bringing it to, you know, where it is today. Yeah. And uh, I can see right now on the page that you guys have raised over $27,000 and that is so impressive. It was really exciting for us because like when we, I remember like when we were first planning for it we were like <laughs> let's aim to get five five thousand at most and like you know we we're like listing out all of our friends and family thinking you know if worse comes to us we can just ask them to like buy the shirts online <laughs> when it actually went live when we started sharing it um the response was really overwhelming um like overwhelmingly positive and i think um it really allowed us to see the power of crowdfunding on launch good and um just the power of like social media really and how word was spread but it was it was i think um the people that shared it shared it with such sincerity and such open support that it really just like that really touched us more than any amount of money that we raised absolutely it's such a powerful message in and of itself not counting the money that it just spread throughout the Uyghur community i mean my sister bought one as well oh that's amazing and, uh, yeah, and it looks really good. It's <laughs> I'm so I happy love, to hear that. <laughs> the designs, I really like it that it's just so subtle and out there, but it's also not overtaking the entire outfit. Mm. But I am not a fashion designer, uh, so I can't comment too much on that. It just looks good to me. And so with that in mind, were you the one who worked on creating these designs for the shirt? Um, so the design of the show was kind of a collaborative effort as well, actually, to be honest. So, um, my friend Intazar Inti, she had the idea of like, like, let's just have like Atlas on the show in the square. And like, she really wanted it to have a sentence underneath that explained what Atlas means. So, um, I really just helped to like, I guess like tighten up the design and actually like bring it to life in a way and helping like with the wording and things like that. And like, taking the first so this the actual like the print on the shirt it's actually a photograph of a real like atlas um fabric piece an atlas scarf so we were like hanging up this silk scarf <laughs> against a plain wall and like taking a photograph on it of it <laughs> to like get it right and so yeah it was it was a fun um collaborative process definitely but i guess um when it comes to like the using Illustrator, for example, to get the design together. Yeah, like that was me. But we all had our input into it. So it was fun to work on it together. Now that the campaign is over, what are you hoping that Uyghur Atlas has achieved just as a more lofty goal? For us, it was really 
like like you mentioned earlier that you know it, it was really popular or like you know Hamzala shared quite widely within the Uyghur community but I think for us like that that is always really important having the Uyghur people embrace the idea and be proud of something that represents their culture but it was also just like the amount of non-Uyghur people that were sharing it and buying it I feel like like a lot of my um you know friends for example on Instagram that shared it actually weren't necessarily Uyghur and I feel like having that level of um sharing visibility of like what is happening to our people today in circles that go beyond just our sort of um Uyghur bubble I think that was really important and so I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not but our Uyghur Atlas project we also got an interview from AJ plus so that was like that was just like next level like that was just like wow like people from you know, a respected digital media organization like AJ Plus want to share our story and I think it's worth hearing. And within that interview, like I had to think about, you know, what is this, what is the actual message that we need to share with like, I don't know, over 10 million people that they have on their, on their Facebook page. And for us, it came down to, you know, like there is a lot of like terrible stuff happening and like, you know, with the concentration camps and, and things like that, and it shouldn't be happening, but the best way that us as a diaspora community can help to um, counter that in a positive way is through celebrating and holding on to our culture. Because I know that's something really important for me. Like I have positive associations as a child, you know, wearing like a pretty Atlas dress and things like that. And really holding on to that and celebrating it and showing people in the world, you know, beyond the Uhu community that this is our culture and this is who we are. And this is important to us, like taking ownership of that and not just taking ownership of it, but, but being proud of it and proudly wearing something that represents who we are to the world. Absolutely. Being picked up by AJ Plus, that's incredible. It's such a broad audience and it shares a message that we always are just more than a tragedy. Yeah. You know, uh, so let's backtrack a little bit and come back to your work at Zalij Creative. What are you doing there right now and how long have you been there? So at Studio Salige, I'm the creative team director. I've been working with our team for about uh, four, just over four years now. So I do a bunch of different things. So I guess like my main sort of focus is to make sure things continue running smoothly and also getting creative and diving into the process when required, which is quite frequently. (laughs) Um, So I focus on like the design research stage, which comes before the actual like physical design, I guess, of things. But for example, one project that I got really hands-on with is Salam Sisters. So in that project, I, I was involved in like, you know, a bit of the research and, and um, figuring out like what the messaging is and who our target market are and things like that. And I also um, have an interest in fashion. So for me, it was an opportunity to um, make doll clothes. So <laughs> that was super fun. I mean, I never expected that, you know, in my work, I would be designing clothing for dolls. So I was literally like, pen and paper like drawing the patterns for the clothing to be cut um and also designing like the way that the headscarf works because our dolls come with headscarves as well and um and like designing like the under cap that they wear and, and things like that so that was it was really it was really fun so at my work I get to do a range of different things from like strategy business development to getting creative and I really enjoy that mix what was the inspiration or what started the Salam Sisters? So the idea for Salam Sisters came from um, our design executive officer, uh, Peter Gould. And he has, so he's, he converted to Islam about like 16 years ago. And he has two really beautiful young daughters. And when looking at the toys that they play with, he was like, you know, my, my young girls don't have any dolls or toys that sort of represent them as a young contemporary Muslim girl today. So it was just about, so the inspiration came from that, you know, creating a range of, of toys and dolls that don't hide from their identity and who are who are influenced by their faith in a positive way but it's not all about you know being Muslim and like memorizing Quran like it's more about just having your faith ground you in your values and going out into the world and dreaming big and achieving your goals so that's that's our the heart of our brand absolutely uh representation is very important Mm. uh and so just having that out there, it, being able to see a reflection of yourself, I think, in the public is important. How did you get started at Zilij? Um, So I got started at Zilij, I think, while I was still studying at university. I was just like an intern for about 
a week or two <laughs> and then a project came through that required managing. So I just sort of started from there. When you were studying in university, did you meet the the founder or did you just apply for the position? Was um, working in a creative studio or marketing system of sorts, uh, was that something of interest to you? Um, to be honest, it, it kind of, it really happens really organically. So I had met Peter through some mutual friends in Sydney, and we also happened to be at like the same event at one point, but I never had like a strong vision or a desire, I guess, to work in the creative industry or you know, in marketing and branding and things like that. It was never like a clear goal of mine, but I guess like something that, um, I enjoy doing is just looking at, you know, different opportunities and seeing if I can contribute. So when it came to like the internship um, at Peter's studio, I, I, saw, I saw him sharing it on Facebook and I was like, hey, like, why don't I apply for that? So I just went for it because I figured like I could be useful in that particular project that he was speaking about, um, that he was, you know, advertising internship for. And yeah, alhamdulillah, um, I got it. And yeah, it just snowballed from there and I'm still here today. <laughs> Oh, now, would you say that this is uh, a passion that you have, that you're very passionate about your work and what you're doing? That's a really good question. I feel like I feel like when it comes to passion, it's essentially like, you know, what is what is the thing that is really important to you, like in your life? Like, like what's the core of like that impact that you want to have in the world, right? During the short time you have on earth. And for me, it's like, it's a mix of different things. But I think um, like when it comes to using design as a way to help solve problems and that could be anything like that could be like solving the problem of how do we um, enable local culture and identity to reach a much broader and varied audience right like you can sort of address that from like a design thinking perspective so I guess I am passionate about that in a way but you know I'm also passionate about like spending time with my family you know what I mean so I guess it's just like at the heart of it it's like doing the best that you can with the amount of skills and limited knowledge that you have to just sort of, and this is going to sound really cheesy, but just like help make the world a better place. Even if it's just like playing with my niece, you know, during storytelling time or something like that. Um, and I feel really blessed to have the opportunity to work in a workplace that aligns with my values and that enables me to be creative and take risks and just try different things. So yeah. I don't think that's cheesy at all. Just wanting to do a good things or make the world a better place is something I think that everyone should be aspiring to. And in a way, everyone wants to be a part of. Yeah, it's not even about having big lofty goals and dreams. I'm like, they're fantastic. I think it's amazing to have like big dreams is really important. But I, f I feel like sometimes you can just like get lost in a vision of like this massive dream and not realize that you can make the world a better place just by being nice. You know what I mean? Just like... When you're on the train, just like smile at the person <laughs> next to you. Like it even translates down to things like that. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. Now we talked a little bit about what your childhood was like having to deal with uh, the third culture experience, but what was it like to be you growing up? Um, like in what sense? I guess um, the environment that you were in, the kind of person that you were as you were growing up. Just how did that shape you into the person you are? Hmm, that's a deep question. <laughs> I mean, I grew up in a very, um, I would say, very warm and happy environment. Like, they're the two words that come to mind for me. Um, alhamdulillah. I've always had, like, a super supportive family. Um, like, parents that have always, like, allowed me to just, like, be, but also pushed me, I guess, to, to try different things. But, yeah, I think I think, like, overall, like, my childhood has just been really, like, like a really safe and positive and happy time. Like I can't like, yeah, I couldn't have asked for anything better. I feel like being a child in Australia was just like such a massive, massive blessing and just such a huge amount of privilege that just comes with that. You know, having um, both of my parents, having both parents that just like brought so much love into our family home, never left us, you know, asking for anything more in any way, wanted us to have fun. You know, and just like, like, as I got older, like my dad really encouraged me to travel a lot. When I was like a late teen, he was like, you know, like just travel, you know, just like explore the world. Like he's like, that's like the best university, the, the university of life. Um, so I think just like having parents like that, that had the vision to come to Australia in the first place 
and took that really scary step to leave everything and their loved ones and their family behind in their home country and really taking that risk for us, like for me and my sister. I mean, like we weren't born yet (laughs) in Australia, but they had that vision, you know? Right. I think that really definitely 100% shaped my childhood and just their sacrifices. Yeah. Were there any significant moments in your life that made you shift your way of thinking or was a revelation to you somehow? I suppose there have been a few of those moments, but the one that I would focus on um, at the moment is just the time that I visited Al Hulja in 2014. I think that really, like, that really just brought to life the experience of what it meant to be in Uyghur in that part of the world and how your identity is just not. It's just not welcome, you know, and the intense amount of surveillance and things like that and just the lack of freedom and, and all of it. It was, it was a really intense experience. And I think um, coming back from that, my biggest regret actually was not taking more photos during that time. I mean, I've got a few and, and not taking more like videos of like my grandma um, speaking and things like that. And she's passed away since. So there's no opportunity to do that again. But I think that was a really like... I don't want to say life changing, but definitely perspective shifting experience. Um, and it took me a while. So like that was early 2014. And then I think like over the next four to five years, about 2019 now, um, in the next four to five years, I just really kind of like sat with me and I was like, like, I can't, like, I can't not do something about you know, sharing what it means to be equal with the world. Like I just can't not do something about it. So that it's, it's all kind of like culminated in, well, it's led to like various like exploration of various projects along the way. And it's at the moment, it's culminated in this Uyghur Atlas project. So we'll see what comes next. Uh, my condolences uh, about your grandmother. Thank you. So what does it mean for you to be Uyghur? I think it's it's a gift, you know, like it's a gift to have the culture that you have and to come from the people that you come from. I mean, like you can't ask for that. You can't choose it, but it's a blessing, you know, and, and I think that being Uyghur for me, it's it's definitely something to be proud of. It means so much to me. I mean, like it it's something that connects me to an amazing history, which I sadly do not know enough about, but I know it's an amazing history. A language, you know, it connects me to our food and the way that like we treat our guests, for example. And it's, it's in everything. It's in, in every, every interaction that I, I have, like despite having grown up in Australia, it's very much informed by my heritage, by my ancestors. Like, yeah, it's, it's a massive blessing. It's a massive gift and it's something beautiful. And it's also something that causes like, not causes, but requires a bit of heartbreak as well in terms of the reality of the situation of Uyghur people. And that's a responsibility. But I think at essence, it's something beautiful. Uh, so I read a little bit about this project called The Modest Bride and how much influence or interaction or involvement do you have in that project? So The Modest Bride was started by my sister, who I mentioned earlier, her name is Sultanat, and she started it. I think after she got married, um, as like, cause she was still looking at wedding related stuff even after her wedding. So she just, and that was when like Instagram, I think had just started or like it was quite new at the time. And, um, she was just sharing like curated content on there and yeah, it kind of took off. And I think now it has like 50,000 followers or something. So my level of involvement in that is, um, as the brand, I guess, and the content creation sort of grew, we decided to, um, try our hand at doing our own styled photo shoots. So we would like receive different dresses from like different vendors and, you know, um, like photographers and and things like that and style our own um, editorials. So yeah, I've been involved in a few of those and and just sharing it. Yeah, I was taking a look at some of the Modest Bride shoots on the Laza photography page and these are stunning. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah, it was super fun. It's like a, a creative expression um, with the, the goal of just inspiring people to choose um, clothing that they're comfortable with on their wedding day. Absolutely. Uh, so what is the best or most worthwhile investment you've made? This could be money, time, energy, or anything else. I think traveling. Yeah, I travel quite a bit and I don't regret a cent <laughs> that I've spent on it. And I don't regret like a second of time that I've spent. Yeah, while traveling. Uh, so where have you been? 
Uh, the first time I ever left Australia, I went to Istanbul, uh, which is like my favorite city in the world. I love it there so much. And for me, I think I, I loved Istanbul so much because because it was the first time I left Australia and landing in Istanbul, like the culture and the language are kind of similar to Oyukho, right? So like when you're like not focusing, it kind of sounds like they might be speaking Oyukho. <laughs> so it just honestly, it felt like coming home in a different way that I'd never experienced in Australia before. I don't know really how to explain it, but it had that feeling for me. It had that sort of like like weird familiarity in a way. Um, so that was the first place I ever went to. I've also been to um, to the UK. I go to London quite a bit. Um, I've been to Morocco, Spain, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, um, East Turkestan. Um, I've been to Germany. Um, I like going there. I've been to Indonesia, Brunei, Malaysia. Oh, oh Dubai. Sorry, I, I spent like three months in Dubai. I was like living there for a bit. That was like for a client project. So it's like a mix of like personal travel and work travel as well. Very cool. So you said that you love Istanbul because it's so similar to the Uyghurs, right? It's just the the language and stuff. I definitely agree with you. Istanbul, it has a liveliness to it. Yeah. It, it feels like the city is always alive. Like every hour of the day, it just feels like buzzing. And you don't really get that in, um, at least not in Canada, because none of the cities here are big enough for that. Yeah. Even in Sydney, to be honest, like everything here closes at like 6 p.m. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But yeah, I love it. I love the energy of the place and just like the natural beauty and like the history history and like the different civilizations just kind of like layered over one another it's it's so exciting i just love it what are some of the greatest experiences you've had while you were traveling to be honest it always 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 boils down to the people for me personally like when i travel i love to stay either with like family or friends of family or friends of friends at least for like, you know, a little part of my trip every time I go. Like it's like a mix between Airbnb hotel, but definitely staying with someone that knows someone as well. And for me, that's just like, like that's what makes it, you know, like it's really nice to be able to like check out the views and, you know, take a walk and experience like the city. But I feel like the best way to experience the city itself is to experience it through the people. And it, it just, it's a much richer and deeper experience of it. And it's, from like a very like particular lens of that family that you might be staying with. But I love it. Like you get to see how people live and um, what sorts of things matter to them. And all of that is informed by their environment. So yeah, definitely the people that I meet. Okay. So we're going to run some quick fire questions right now. Okay. Do you have a morning or evening routine? Um, no. <laughs> well, the, the one routine I have in the morning is always having like, a glass of warm honey water to start my day. And how did you get started on that? My mom. <laughs> She's always like, you have to start your day with warm water and ideally with a bit of honey in it. So it's just something I've maintained. Uh, do you have a favorite Uyghur quote? I don't have a favorite Uyghur quote, but um, I really like that poem, Isla. I think it's called Isla. I think it translates into tracks in English. Yeah, but I mean, like, honestly, that's like the only poem that I, I'm aware of in Uyghur, so <laughs> that's why it's my favorite. <laughs> so what is one book that has resonated with you? Hmm, one book. So one book that I really enjoyed reading was um, uh, Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown. She does an amazing job in that book. It's so good. I highly recommend everyone to read it. And what I liked about it is that it's about having vulnerable conversations, right? And I think that's something that's really lacking um, specifically in the Uyghur community. And like, I think um, even more specifically in like my parents' generation, like there's like this, it's like our people and our parents and, and their parents have experienced so much trauma, for example, from, you know, growing up during the Cultural Revolution in China and things like that. And the I feel like there's definitely a lack of vulnerable conversations about what that experience was like and how we can move toward healing that. So I feel like like that book was really um, eye-opening for me in a lot of ways. And even just in like my personal life, it's like, you know, it's okay to have a completely opposite opinion to the person across from you, but to have that conversation in a beneficial way that's like, yeah, that, that's transformative for both people. And you don't even have to agree, but just having the conversation and being honest about it, like, yeah. That book is what taught me that. So I recommend everyone to read it. Yeah, Brene Brown is a very powerful author. I read Daring Greatly. I haven't read that one yet, but Braving the, you should read Braving the Wilderness. It's so good. 
I'll definitely put that on my list. Uh, yeah, she she just uh, infuses storytelling and science in a really good way. And she talks about a very important topic. Uh, and you're right that people aren't having enough conversations where they're exposing themselves. So what are your obsessions right now? Um, I'm obsessed with a particular brand of organic chocolate. <laughs> it's called Panna, Panna Chocolate. Um, and they recently released a line of ice cream. So I'm a big fan of that right now. And the reason why I like it is because they don't use refined sugar. So I've been looking for like, I've been looking to minimize the amount of refined sugar I eat in my life. So this has been a good alternative because I have a massive sweet tooth. So yeah. Ice cream is definitely worth obsessing over. I would, I'll say that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, do you have any asks or requests from the audience? Um, okay, so I would ask everyone to forgive me if I've said anything ridiculous in this podcast. <laughs> it's a powerful request. Yeah, please forgive me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Aside from the apology, uh, do you have any last parting words? Um, I was, okay, so I was listening to a podcast podcast recently about essentialism. So it sounds like, I feel, I feel like you're a Tim Ferriss fan. Are you? Uh, Tim Ferriss fan. Um, oh, like you have you listened to his podcast I've, before? I've definitely listened to his podcast before. He's got some good ones, but he he also has some that are misses. Right. So one of the the podcasts or the one of the interviews that he conducted um, was with I forget the guy's name. Um, the guy who wrote a book on essentialism. It's a really good listen. I would recommend you to hear that. It's, it it was just yeah, it was really amazing. So, but one thing that um, I learned from listening to that is that. It's like every every dis- every moment that you have and like every decision that you make, you can either choose to like lean into the good or you can either choose to lean into the negative. So I feel like, you know, us being of this generation of Uyghur people and Uyghur youth and that are kind of at this transition point between like the history of our parents and like the generation that's coming next, like we are literally that generation that can make a decision right now to lean into the good and to be like, like we can change our narrative, basically. I know that's such a like cliche thing to say, but like we are literally the people that can and will do that. So yeah, I'm really excited to see um, just how proactive like all these amazing Uber people are around me. And it's super inspiring. And I feel like it doesn't come from a sense of like undue pride or something like that. It's just like, like we are literally at the frontier of what it means to be Uyghur in the world today. And like, we can really create something, not create, but we can really hold on to something beautiful and shape it towards something even more positive, inshallah. Those are some very wise words. And for anyone is interested, I will also link the episode of the Tim Ferriss show into the show notes if they want to hear more about this. So where can people reach you, Subi, if they want to talk to you or ask you questions or just uh, keep themselves updated with what you're doing? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, it's just my first name, full stop, my surname. So Subi Dobara. Perfect. I want to thank you very much. Subi, for coming onto the show and giving us your insights and telling us a little bit more about yourselves. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I'm sure all the listeners will appreciate it as well. Thank you. Thanks so much.